So tonight we are indebted to Kathleen and John Bricker for sponsoring this memorial lecture, and I'm delighted to have Jacob Howland here as our speaker. Jacob Howland is the McFarland Professor of Philosophy at the University of Tulsa, where he's received numerous teaching awards since arriving in 1988. You may see uh, Jacob, you might be the only one who would recognize it. On my flyer, I made an error, and I inadvertently took away 10 years from your life because I saw 1998. Instead of indicating that you belong, as I think I do too, to that breed of professors whose whole career was committed to one institution. So uh, Howland arrived in Tulsa after completing his PhD at Pennsylvania State University. I also don't know exactly how that impressive philosophy department developed, but it certainly produced a number of distinguished scholars and teachers, including our colleague, Richard Buckley. I've known Jake for many years and have watched with great interest the trajectory of his studies, which has evolved on a path intersecting at certain points with my own. He began with Greek philosophy. His first book was on Plato's Republic. Its subtitle, The Odyssey of Philosophy, indicated the lens he found for viewing the Republic through the model of Homer's Odyssey. We hear in the Platonic dialogue of, quote, the ancient quarrel between poetry and philosophy. But the Platonic dialogue itself unites them. Howland's next book, The Paradox of Philosophy, which some of our graduate students are reading right now, took up the philosophic trial of Socrates in a set of dialogues with dramatic connections to those that portray the political trial, imprisonment, and execution of the philosopher by the city. Setting out from his understanding of Plato's Socrates, Holland went on to write a book on Kierkegaard's Socrates and the role that figure plays in the Danish philosopher's reflections on Christian faith. That study is complemented by another book, Plato and the Talmud, which is a very unusual exploration of the connection between two traditions and two sets of texts rarely considered in relation to one another. Recently, Howland has been engaged in writing and speaking on philosophic approaches to the Bible, which I've found really stimulating for my own studies. I should mention, finally, his essays on the Italian writer Primo Levi or the French filmmaker Claude Lanzmann, among others, who attempt to reflect on and preserve the memory of the Holocaust. As I look over the path I just outlined, one underlying thread spread stands out. All of Howland's work involves questioning the established boundaries that are supposed to separate one discipline or one way of thinking from another. Philosophy and literature, philosophy and politics, philosophy and faith. Others might be uneasy holding these contrasting spheres together. Howland's thought is enriched by the challenge. I expect you will get a taste of that now when we hear about Kierkegaard on theodicy, law, and love. And I hope we'll have a time for a brief question period afterward. Please join me in welcoming Jacob Howland. Thank you for that very kind really heartwarming introduction. Rana has been a very dear friend um, and a great supporter of my work, and um, I've learned more from her than, um, than she'll ever learn from me, I, and so happy uh, to be here this evening. It's a real pleasure. So my lecture is Kierkegaard on Theodicy, Law, and Love. This evening, I want to talk about the sermon at the very end of Either Or the first of Kierkegaard's many pseudonymous books. The sermon, which unflinchingly acknowledges the problem of theodicy, or the justice of God, plays a pivotal role in Kierkegaard's pro project of shattering the idols of his age so as to awaken his readers to an authentically religious existence. A Christian meditation informed by a deep appreciation of Judaism it forms a bridge to later pseudonymous works on religious faith, like Fear and Trembling and Philosophical Fragments, as well as to the upbuilding discourses of a certain S. Kierkegaard, the first of which appeared in the bookshop only a few months after the publication of Either Or in 1843. 
In what follows, I propose to situate the sermon within either or as a whole, and then in the second half of my lecture to turn to its argument. Ah, that's better. <laughs> so the first section of the talk is called The Literary Ramifications of Desire. Either or, whose subtitle is A Fragment of Life, is a magnificent literary puzzle. The book is a fractal a term derived from the Latin fractus, meaning fracture, that describes objects displaying the same structure at different levels of magnification. As you can see from the diagram I've prepared on the handout, each part of the book reflects the shape of the whole, and structural elements that appear on one level reappear on others. In the book's preface, the pseudonymous Victor Eremita presents himself as the editor of the papers of two men. Part one of Either Or contains aphorisms and essays by the unknown author Eremita calls A, followed by a diary of seduction that is editorially prefaced by A and written by another man named Johannes. Part two contains letters to A by a certain Judge William, whom Eremita calls B, followed by the sermon, which is prefaced by B, and authored by an unidentified pastor of the Danish Lutheran Church. The formal repetition Kierkegaard builds into either or invites us to compare its parts, both within and across divisions and subdivisions. The preface and the so-called ultimatum are related as the bookends of either or, the first word and the last. The importance of the sermon is suggested by the fact that it is literally the last word of the last word, ultimatum. But because the ultimatum is the final section of part two, it is also implicitly connected with the seducer's diary, which is the final section of part one. Well, what's the significance of these formal relationships? What does a seducer's story of conquest and abandonment have to do with a pastor's sermon on the problem of theodicy? And what does the preface have to do with either of these? In order to answer these questions, we must consider the contrast between A and B that stands at the heart of either or. A is a highly cultivated and profoundly disillusioned romantic idealist. Although he is himself wealthy enough to live a life of cultivated idleness, he despises what he regards as the bourgeois shallowness of the respectable Christian citizens of Copenhagen, among whom he finds, as he says, no enthusiasm that endures everything, no faith that moves mountains, no idea that joins the finite and the infinite. Having withdrawn from everyday pursuits and activities, A exists mostly in the spheres of literary imagination and reflective enjoyment consuming music, poetry, and drama, and occasionally writing erudite reviews and essays on subjects like ancient and modern tragedy. His particular obsession with the themes of seduction and betrayal suggests that he is directly acquainted with the phenomenon of faithlessness. While the musical eroticism of Mozart's Don Giovanni offers him the vicarious experience of a vital energy he cannot summon within himself. He writes with inordinate sympathy and insight about the anxiety and confusion of jilted lovers like Mozart's Donna Elvira. A's intensive exploration of erotic longing and frustration raises questions of central importance in Kierkegaard's authorship. Whether anyone or anything is worthy of our love, and if so, whether we are able to love as befits that which is lovable. Living and loving are so closely related for A that he describes his lovelorn existence as dying death rather than living life. Uninvolved in any actual community, he passes time fashioning lectures for an imaginary audience of like-minded individuals he calls sum para necromena, a Greek coinage of Aristophanian flavor that literally means corpses collecting alongside one another. B, Judge William, lives a very different life, 
one as civically engaged and morally substantial as A's is ethereal and detached. Seemingly untroubled by doubt or anxiety and free from any longing for, sorry, any apparent longing for a transcendent reality, the judge is concretely rooted in the very community that A scores. B's papers in either or consist exclusively of letters admonishing A, a man seven years his junior, to follow his own dutiful example of marriage, work, and worship. B argues earnestly and eloquently for an ethically substantial life, an existence that fulfills the shared norms of the community in all of its spheres, including the family, civil society, state, and church. B emphasizes the inner beauty of married life, the quiet virtues of patience, humility, and moderation, and the psychologically unifying power of choosing oneself as an ethically serious person. He seeks to convince A that everyday existence has its own aesthetic perfection, and even its own heroism, that it is not merely good, but beautiful. Living ethically, in other words, is an art, one that consists in expressing universality through particularity, just as any regular verb could serve as a grammatical paradigm for the purposes of learning a language, he explains, every person, if he so wills, can become a paradigmatic human being. In the richly developed characters of A and B, Kierkegaard fleshes out two basic modes or models of contemporary human existence. The aesthetic model reflects an unfulfilled erotic yearning for some transcendent and redeeming meaning. The ethical model finds life's meaning in actively embracing the customs, traditions, and practices of one's time and place. Indeed, both A and B, one willingly, the other not, are creatures of the age. A's longing is filtered through the gauzy ideals of early 19th century romanticism, while B embodies the triumphant social philosophy of the vastly influential thinker G.W.F. Hegel, whose followers included important Danish theologians and philosophers. Hegel argued that history had reached its ultimate goal of human freedom in the equilibrium of I and we, of individual particularity and social universality that is uniquely available in the post-Napoleonic liberal states of Europe. He presents his philosophical explanation of history and of the eternal significance of the achievement of freedom and modernity as the imaginative or figurative story of Christianity translated into proper conceptual terms. For B, as for Hegel, the idea that joins the finite and the infinite in actual human existence, the idea A longs for but cannot find, is what Hegel called Zittigkeit, the concrete ethical life that is right under our noses. To whom do you respond more strongly? Either or, asks the reader, A or B. This is, in some sense, a trick question. Many readers would agree that if A were to embrace the shared life and work of the community, he might be saved from the twin plagues of late and post-modernity, depression and boredom. Yet B is less sure of himself than he first appears to be. Between the lines of his exceedingly lengthy letters, one may read the anxious and vain hope of obtaining from A, who never so much as mentions B, an explicit confirmation of the superiority of his existence. For B, in other words, the intrinsic goodness of the ethical life is insufficient to establish its ultimate value. It must also be certified as beautiful and poetic by an acknowledged authority in such matters. In this crucial respect, either or doubles back on itself instead of opening out onto any larger reality. What is more, B has no hope of receiving the validation for which he longs. A's aloofness from social convention, besides being the very thing that makes him so attractive to B, 
is a fixed and essential component of his identity. In his preface, Eremita tells us that he placed the papers of A and B in a box designed to hold dueling pistols. As this detail underscores, either or presents a closed and humanly constructed universe of negativity and dependence in which both authors are seemingly trapped. Yet this neither nor of unfulfilled yearning is not the book's last word, or even its first. Eremita tells a story in the preface about how he came, a biblical seven years previously, to possess the writings of A and B. This story is rich with symbolism and meaningful on multiple levels. It foreshadows the inner experience of both men and anticipates the possibility of breaking open the sealed existential circles in which they languish. Eremita explains that he is immediately attracted by an expensive and unnecessary writing desk he spots one day in a store. Like a seducer studying an erotic prospect, he contrives to pass by it in the street every day. But it is he who is ultimately seduced. Eremita aims to make a match on terms convenient to himself, but the desk's owner will not budge. He finally succumbs to what he calls his sophistical and prodigal desire, buys the desk at full price, and takes it home. At this point, his infatuation enters a more intimate phase. He gets to know the desk's many drawers and compartments, and grows, as he says, in every respect, happy with it. The relationship deepens and brings him pleasure, but at the critical moment, his beloved resists him, threatening his entire amorous and material investment. One morning, Eremita awakens at 4 a.m. for a journey at 5, but falls back to sleep until he is roused by his servant at 6.30. Hurriedly preparing to visit the beautiful countryside about which he has just been dreaming, he goes to withdraw cash from the desk's money drawer. The coachman's horn is sounding its poetic motifs, as Eremita puts it, but the drawer sticks. Like its original owner, it simply will not budge. Eremita is provoked. In a vengeful rage, he strikes the desk with a hatchet, like Xerxes, as he says, whipping the sea. The drawer remains closed, but a heretofore unnoticed compartment pops open, revealing the papers of A and B. Eremita's story of love gone bad establishes the basic dramatic pattern of either or. His tale is on one level an allegory of the erotic activity of authorship. It anticipates the frustrations experienced by A and B in trying to fulfill their deepest longings through the medium of writing, longings that have, in turn, been nourished and shaped by reading. Eremita assumed he knew the desk inside and out, but he saw only what he wanted to. Its hidden depths were invisible to his poetic or productive eye. His anger in the face of the desk's recalcitrance shows that he has confused mastery with erotic openness, self-love with the love of another. A and B suffer from a similar limitation with characteristic human perversity. Each lives in a dream world of his own construction. Nevertheless, either or suggests that reading and writing might also have the potential to awaken these men to reality. <clears throat> I have already hinted that Eremita's story anticipates the seducer's diary. At the end of part one, A, who takes Don Giovanni as his model of what it is to love, will himself be seduced by the sight of an exquisitely bound volume in the open drawer of another man's desk. This volume, which he hastily removes, reads and copies with the uneasiness of a person handling radioactive materials is the diary of Johannes. A expresses in a strange way the shock he receives from his experience. When I recall the situation now, he writes, I feel the same way a policeman must feel when he enters a forger's room. But as he is not a policeman, he adds, I would have reacted differently. I would have felt the double weight of the truth that I was on an unlawful path. Double because
because he obtains the diary illicitly, and because its content exposes the profound depravity of the idea of the reflective seducer that, as Eremita observes, he had often vaguely entertained. A speaks here in the peculiarly hypothetical language of poetic imagination. Was he, in fact, sufficiently shaken by this double weight of truth to reform his life? We do not know, but he should have been. The story of Eremita's writing desk and its echo in the seducer's diary also anticipate the pastor's sermon, which in a perfect world would shock B out of the warm bath of ethical and philosophical self-satisfaction in which he slumbers. Indeed, Eremita's narrative is at bottom a religious allegory in which the desk and its literary contents stand for the teaching and practice of Christianity as taught in the Bible. Our editor's name provides a clue to this level of meaning. An Eremite is a religious recluse or desert monk, one who, recognizing that he is bereft, eremos in Greek, attempts absolutely to accommodate his life to the demands of God. Eremita, of course, is something else, an independent and respectable urbanite who sets a high value on his accustomed liberties. What is more, he twice describes his behavior in purchasing the desk as prodigal, like the son in the parable of Luke, who wastes the inheritance of his heavenly as well as his earthly father. Although he initially regards the desk as an unnecessary luxury, he makes room for it in his home, grows comfortable with it, and gets to know it after a fashion. This means something like he goes to church, learns the Bible as it is taught from the pulpit, and appreciates at least those of its lessons that can be readily domesticated. But he has no intimate or inward understanding of faith or of the intransigent realities with which faith contends. Seen in this context, Eremita's early morning dream of the beautiful land he would soon be visiting seems like a self-congratulatory anticipation of a life or an afterlife he has paid for in the social currency of Danish Christianity, but by no means earned in spiritual terms. He will, in any case, soon be roused by the coachman's poetic motifs, a phrase that urges us to interpret in a non-literal fashion the horn blast that calls him to order. If the echo of the ram's horn announcing God's highly dramatic appearance at Mount Sinai were not enough, Kierkegaard elsewhere compares, in a book called Judge for Yourself, the radically sobering impression of what he calls the unconditioned to the terrible lash that the royal coachman, standing high in his box, brings down on a high-spirited horse in order to make it concentrate every trembling muscle on standing still. The fiery animal, for whom standing still is an act, an effort, the greatest, learns one fundamental thing from the royal coachman's whip, who it is who wields the latch. In Eremita's story, it is he who wants to move, and the desk, and its owner, that arrests his motion. The drawer's stubbornness causes him to strike the desk in a towering rage, like the Persian emperor Xerxes, whipping the sea after it had destroyed the pontoon bridge by which he sought to yoke the Hellespont. The sea was a Persian god. The tragedy of Xerxes, who subsequently experienced divine retribution in the form of a crushing military defeat, was his inability to distinguish the whipper from the whipped. Just so, Eremita's violence releases from the desk a surge of hidden power, like God bursting forth from the Ark of the Covenant. This power builds and intensifies as it moves through either or, targeting not just A and B, but all readers who recognize themselves in these men. In the very first words he writes to A, B compares himself to the prophet Nathan, speaking truth to King David's power. 
This is deeply ironic, for Judge William, a man of honorable office, secure prospects, and cultivated opinion, is the epitome of power. With Xerxian self-satisfaction, B surveys his existence from what Hegel teaches is the eternal standpoint of the end of history. As the pseudonymous author Johannes de Salentio writes in Fear and Trembling, the ethical sphere as conceived by Hegel, Hegel is all-encompassing. He writes, it rests Im imminently in itself, and it is itself the telos for everything outside itself, and when the ethical has assimilated this into itself, it goes no further. This theoretical and practical omnivorousness extends to matters of faith, and is reflected in B's recommendation of the sermon to A on the ground that it expresses exactly what he's been trying to say all along. Take it then, read it, B advises A, outrageously, but with a deep and unintended meaning, echoing the very words of God that prompted the religious conversion of St. Augustine, as he relates it in the Confessions. Opening his book of scripture, Augustine's eye fell on Romans 13, verse 13, which begins, let us walk honestly as in the day. The immediately preceding verses, verses declare that it is high time to awake out of sleep, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. But B is a deep sleeper, so deep that he cannot hear the tremendous gong he has just sounded. His remark that the sermon can be understood by any peasant, quote, because it's precisely the beauty of the universal that we're all able to understand it, end quote, is ignorant in the extreme. For the sermon speaks in the authentically disruptive voice of prophecy. A voice that if B could only hear it, would shatter his assumption that there is no God to whom he must give accounts beyond the cultural and religious norms of his time and place. It is late and the coachman is sounding his horn. High time to turn to the sermon itself. Part two, the Odyssey Law and Love in the Sermon of Either Or. Like the rest of Either Or, the sermon is a fractal. Its title, the upbuilding that lies in the thought that in relation to God we are always in the wrong is also the title of the second of its two parts. The pastor furthermore introduces his subject in a curious way. The Holy Gospel, he writes, is written in the 19th chapter of the Gospel of St. Luke. These repetitions, I believe, are meant to alert us to three features of the sermon. The first is the pastor's duplication of the prophetic voice of Jesus in addressing the proud new Jerusalem of the Christians. The second is his use of two spiritual registers, one distinctively Jewish, the other distinctively Christian, in articulating two solutions to the problem of the Odyssey. <coughs> the third is his implicit transfiguration and harmonization of the conflicting voices of A and B. In the sermon, B's notion of ethical obligation is reconceived as the duty to love God, excuse me, to love justice, contend with God, and cling to Him in whatever shape He presents Himself. Similarly, A's longing for transcendence reverberates in what the pastor identifies as the supreme wish of a love that is genuinely infinite, the wish always to be in the wrong in relation to the love. The hope of the sermon is that these uncompromising words of religious duty and love might help us to discover a wellspring of vital energy in the face of life's hard and inscrutable realities. The pastor quotes Luke chapter 19 verses 41 to 48 as follows, and this is on your handout. And when he, Jesus, drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, would that even today you knew the things that make for peace. But now they are hid from your eyes. For the days shall come upon you when your enemies will cast up a bank about you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And then will dash you to the ground and your children within you and will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he taught daily in the temple. 
But the chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people sought to destroy him. But they did not find what they should do. For all the people clung to him and listened to him. This passage connects the visitation of which Jesus speaks with the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. Hegel identifies the supposedly rational and necessary process of history with God. But in destroying Jerusalem, God breaks freely and unpredictably into history. Indeed, it is Jesus who first disturbs the accustomed peace. In driving out from the temple those who sell there, he teaches that faith cannot be reduced to any sort of quid pro quo between God and man, no matter how it may be denominated. The pastor approaches this point obliquely, focusing first on the scripture's curious anthropomorphism of proud Jerusalem, where Jesus speaks not to individuals, nor to the Jewish people as a whole, but to the city. He does not prophesy, the pastor says. There is no more time for that. He weeps over Jerusalem, and yet the city still stood in all its glory, and the temple still carried its head as high as always, higher than any other building in the world. In Luke 19, Jesus addresses the edifice of Second Temple Judaism, the we, the Zitlichkeit that is in the wrong in relation to God, is the religious establishment of the chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people. But as the pastor reads it, this passage contains a grave warning for contemporary Christendom. Like Jesus, who is himself channeling Isaiah, the pastor speaks prophetically in suggesting the stunning possibility of God's repudiation of the modern Jerusalem in any or all of its incarnations, including the proud establishment of Danish Lutheranism. As the Kierkegaard scholar Louis Mackey observes in another connection, this is a quotation, when it is a question of reintroducing Christianity in all its majesty and terror to self-assured, matter-of-fact, mass-produced Christians, who have waxed overconfident in their possession of this great treasure, then only the shock of contradiction will do. And the shock is great indeed. The pastor's essential point is that, these are his words, the destruction of Jerusalem was a punishment, and it fell on the innocent just as hard as on the guilty. Now, how should we respond to this inconvenient truth? Should we say, the pastor asks, it will be 2,000 years since those days? A nightmare such as the world never saw before and will presumably never see again. We will hope and trust that our days and our children's days may proceed in tranquility, untouched by the storms of life. The pastor rejects this kind of talk as utterly cowardly and dismal. Does it explain the unexplainable, he asks? To say that it has happened only once in the world? Or is this not the unexplainable, that it has happened? Does not this, that it has happened, have the power to make everything else unexplainable? And what assurance is there that that was not the truth, and what ordinarily occurs is the untruth? Only today, in the light of historical hindsight, can one fully appreciate how penetrating these questions really are, and how dangerous to our self-conception as essentially rational beings. They anticipate some of the deepest philosophical responses to the Holocaust, including Jean Améry's argument in his essay, At the Mind's Limits, that the experience of Auschwitz revealed the true nature of reality, as well as the fundamental incompetence of the human intellect in the face of this ultimate truth. Could the pastor want us to reach a similar conclusion about the weakness of human understanding? What are we to do with the problem to which he has called our attention? Jesus weeps with compassion, but the pastor speaks of a God who is distant and inscrutable. God in his own nature and majesty, as Luther writes, who neither deplores nor takes away death, but works life and death and all in all, and who is, Luther warns, to be left alone. This seems like good advice. 
inasmuch as the thought that the lot of the righteous is on a level with the lot of the unrighteous threatens to derail faith altogether. Does then godliness have no promise for this life that is, the pastor asks? Is that every uplifting thought that once made you so rich in courage and confidence only a fancy, a jugglery that a child believes in, a youth hopes for, but in which someone a little older finds no blessing, but only mockery and offense? If this is the risk one raises, one runs in raising the problem of theodicy, why do so? The answer to this question is that life and faith are always at risk. We need not seek out reality, for it will find us. As Johannes de Salentio observes in Fear and Trembling, life inevitably fractures what is united in the pious simplicity of the child. Real faith does not confuse success with merit, good fortune with divine approval. It comes to grips with the fundamental reality that in this world, the righteous suffer no less, and in bad times far more than the wicked. And yet the pastor insists that we regard the path of righteousness as a blessing, and that not in another life, but in this one. If he can help us to experience life in this way, he will have compelled us to acknowledge the fragility of all human constructions in the face of what is. More, he will have offered a practical solution to the problem of theodicy, something infinitely more valuable to an existing human being than a theoretical one. This is the burden of his sermon. In fact, the pastor offers two distinct sorts of speeches, each aimed at persuading a different kind of character or type of soul. One urges reverence for the divine law, understood morally and not, or not simply, ritual, and is meant to encourage those for whom the spirited voices of the Hebrew prophets resonate most strongly. The other unpacks what it means to love someone and is intended to persuade those who are especially drawn to the teaching of God as love. One speech is directed toward primarily erotic souls, the other toward what the Greeks called thumaios, spirited individuals moved above all by the call of justice. Provided we recognize that both the Hebrew and the Christian scriptures direct us to love God and do justice, we may say that the first speech is characteristically Jewish in tone and emphasis, and the second Christian. The Thumatic Jewish speech is less than a page long, much shorter than its erotic Christian counterpart. It is meant to appeal to strong-willed and morally determined individuals. The words Jesus hurls into the temple in Luke 19, my house is a house of prayer, are drawn from the 56th chapter of Isaiah, which begins with God's exhortation to observe what is right and do what is just. Happy is the man who does this, the man who holds fast to it, Isaiah proclaims. Although we are given to understand that this happiness is internal to the being of righteous men and women, independently of what happens to them. For some good people will find their lives choked off like withered trees in Isaiah's image. To these, God promises in verse 5 of chapter 56 that I will give them in my house and within my walls a hand and a name, Yad Vashem, now the name of Israel's monument in Jerusalem to the victims of the Holocaust. Following the trail blazed in Isaiah, the pastor vigorously insists that the teaching of godliness cannot be a mockery and offense. This thought revolts you, he proclaims. It cannot and must not gain the power to beguile you, must not be able to dull your soul. Justice you will love. Justice you will practice early and late. Even if it has no reward, you will practice it. You will you feel that it has an implicit demand that still must be fulfilled. You will not sink into lethargy, and then at some point comprehend that justice did have promises, but that you yourself had excluded yourself from them by not doing justice. You will not contend with men. You will contend with God and hold on to him. He is not going to get away from you without blessing. You will. You must. These are noble imperatives. 
to cling to righteousness with the doggedness of Jacob wrestling the angel, to hold fast to God and the love of justice come what may. This is blessedness, because in life it is the greatest blessing not to lose one's grip on the things that matter. Jacob's struggle earns him the name of Israel. This name, which means something like contends with God, is not what men call him, but the true name of the peculiar being he receives at the hand of God. Yet this divine Yad Vashem cannot make us forget that Jacob is permanently wounded by the angel he wrestles through the dark hours of the night. That is to say, the way of Israel and Isaiah is hard and painful and suited to hearts of heroic temper. It is one that few individuals will see to the end, and many of those limping. Yet it must be said that the Jewish people as a whole have followed and are following this rough path. The house of Israel abides, even if the temple does not. And the historically miraculous fact of its survival in the face of numerous disasters has certainly strengthened many non-heroic individuals. The pastor, however, is addressing a Lutheran congregation in a place where Christianity has for many centuries enjoyed a comfortable cultural ascendancy. That is why he proposes to speak in a different way, as he puts it. He does not deny that he might already have sufficiently encouraged some great souls. Perhaps there is even a Christian Socrates in his audience for whom it suffices merely to know the good in order to do it. But most will have to follow another route to the blessings of faith. The pastor's new way of speaking explores the power of love to build us up for the tasks of justice and righteousness, where the upbuilding refers to that which puts an end to doubt and calms the cares, animates and inspires to action. He begins by attacking a bit of cheap wisdom that purports to reassure us when we feel defeated by life, when even those to whom we look up in trust and confidence may be seen wavering in life, when we hear a soft voice whispering that life is but bad troubles and faith but a snare that wrenches us out into the infinite where we really are unable to live, we may seek comfort in the thought that God is certainly reasonable enough to accept that one does what one can. But if you have ever experienced unrest, the pastor says, because you did not know for sure how much one can do, or worried that you might not have done what you could, or seen in another skeptical and imploring look the question whether it was not possible that you could do more, you know that this seemingly easy, cozy conclusion only produces new anxieties and doubts. If we lack the self-knowledge to measure our powers, how can we be confident that we will prove equal to the trials of life? How can we escape condemning ourselves for not doing what we suppose we might have done? Paradoxically, the pastor proposes to calm our doubts and cares about what we can do by deliberating on what we cannot. No less paradoxically, his thought that in relation to God we are always in the wrong seems to take us directly out into the infinite. The pastor observes that it is painful to admit that one is in the wrong. But we are encouraged in doing so by the prospect that such admissions will more and more rarely be necessary. But if the hope of moral improvement sustains us, how can the view that we're always in the wrong also do so? When we are wronged by others who do not love justice and righteousness, he observes, we find a satisfaction, a joy in the thought that we are in the right. Then how can the knowledge that we're always in the wrong have the same effect? Answer is supplied not by reason, but by love. For things are different when we have been wronged by someone we love fervently. Ah, if you loved him, the pastor observed, then it would not calm you to know that you are in the right. Oh no, if you loved him, this thought would only alarm you. You would wish that you might be in the wrong. You would try to find something that could speak in his defense. You would reach for every probability, and if you found none, you would tear up the accounting in order to help you forget it. And you would strive to build yourself up with the thought that you were in the wrong. The difference, he explains, is that in one case you loved, and the other you did not. In other words, in the one case you were in, in an infinite relationship with a person. In the other case, in a finite relationship. Hence, it is upbuilding always to be in the wrong, because only the infinite builds up. 
The finite does not. But what does it mean to say that love is an infinite relationship, and how precisely does it build one up? The pastor later remarks that the love within you is your total being. We may add that love loves the total being of another. In other words, love is of and for the whole person. And if it truly is love, it is infinite, in that it would do anything for the essential good of the other. Like Isaiah and Jesus and Socrates too, the pastor conceives of this essential good in moral and spiritual terms. In particular, he assumes that the you he addresses have already internalized the biblical obligation to love justice and righteousness and are alarmed at the possibility that the one you love has not. But he also assumes that you harbor secret fears about your own fidelity to what is right and good that you are anxious, in other words, about sin. You must therefore consider the possibility that it is you who are at fault because of something you did or failed to do in relation to the other. And here is the beautiful twist on which the whole argument turns. You're glad to do so because you love the other that is infinitely, truly that is infinitely. It is this very possibility that comforts you and inspires you to action for it means that there is something you can do to right the wrong. The pastor makes absolutely clear that it is love alone that builds you up. You could reach the conclusion that you are always in the wrong in relation to God simply by considering that God is greater, wiser, and holier than you are. But a conclusion that you are forced to reach by logical necessity does not build you up. Only the passion of love can do so because only when your soul and supreme wish is to be in the wrong, will you happy, happily and enthusiastically strive to do better. You freely wish to be in the wrong in relation to a person because you love that person. So it is in relation to God. Thus, it was not through deliberation that you became certain that you were always in the wrong, the pastor declares, but the certainty was due to your being built up by it. This knowledge, one might say, is love's knowledge. It is backed not by arguments, but by passion, by the soul's demand to love deeply. For only in that, the pastor says, could you find rest and peace and happiness. Toward the end of the sermon, the pastor raises a question that will already have occurred to you. He asks whether the thought that one is always in the wrong in relation to God might lull one into a sleep in which he dreams of a relationship with God that is no actual relationship, vitiating the power of the will and the strength of intention. Not at all, he answers, although his understanding of the question turns out to be rather peculiar. The man who wished to be always in the wrong in relation to another man, he observes, was by no means apathetic and idle, but did all he could to be in the right and yet wished only to be in the wrong. That we're always in the wrong in relation to God means that God's love his fidelity to us is always greater than our own love for anyone or anything. It also means that God's forbearance is greater than ours. Does not this thought make him happy to act, the pastor asks? For when he doubts, he has no energy to act. Does it not make his spirit glow? For when he reckons finitely, the fire of the spirit is extinguished. This thought, he insists, can sustain one through any trial. If you have to deny yourself your highest wish, if you have to betray your duty, if you lost not only your joy but even your honor, if the punishment that the iniquity of the fathers had called down came upon you, you are still happy in your work, he says, because in relation to God, you are always in the law. What's peculiar about this reply is that all the emphasis is on the experience of love and the way this experience is translated into action and actuality and to work in the face of adversity. The pastor does not address the question of whether God, or at least this loving God, might himself be a mere dream. Could one have an actual relationship with an imaginary being? Could one faithfully love a phantasm conjured by one's own neediness, especially if one has doubts about one's ability to love anyone faithfully? These are the same questions that torment A and perhaps anyone who has been deceived in love. The very last words of the sermon, of part two of either form, and of the book as a whole, speak to them in a novel way. And this is also in your handout. 
One more question before we part, my listener. Could you wish, would you wish that the situation were different? Could you wish that you might be in the right against God? Could you wish that the beautiful law, that beautiful law, which for thousands of years has carried the generation through life, and every member of the generation, that beautiful law, more glorious than the law which carried the stars on their heads across the arch of heaven, could you wish that that law would break an even more terrible catastrophe than if the law of nature lost its power and everything disintegrated into dreadful chaos? Could you wish that? In very truth, it is a matter of salvation. Do not interrupt the plight of your soul. Do not distress what is best in you. Do not enfeeble your spirit with half wishes and half thoughts. Ask yourself and keep on asking until you find the answer. For one may have known something many times, acknowledged it. One may have willed something many times, attempted it. And yet, only the deep inner motion, only the heart's indescribable emotion, only that will convince you that what you have acknowledged belongs to you, that no power can take it from you. For only the truth that fills up is the truth for you. This conclusion, which in a way recapitulates the sermon as a whole, directs us inward in intensive self-examination. It is as if the soul, rebounding from its collision with the intellectually intractable problem of theodicy, is driven back into itself. This is a characteristically Kierkegaardian term for which the sermon implicitly offers at least two arguments. First, we must recognize that we are individually as well as collectively responsible for preserving all that is good and beautiful in our lives. When we do not act with justice and compassion, human order is submerged in violence and brutality. The beautiful law to which the pastor refers is thus perfectly ambiguous. It is, to be sure, the revealed law of God, the justice and righteousness demanded of us by the Hebrew prophets. But it is also the law of love, modeled in the person of Jesus, the infinite love of others and of one's neighbor as oneself. The laws of justice and love are sustained only through the passionate striving of human beings. God might be as real as one could wish, but without this saving passion, our relationship with him would have no real effects in this world. Second, Theoretical reflection about the independent actuality of God is both untimely and unavailable. The law is revealed, the prophets have spoken, and now we must act. We cannot know whether God's love will sustain us, or, what perhaps amounts to the same thing, whether our love of God will be, to borrow an expression from Isaiah, like a spring whose waters do not fail. But if we drill down into our souls past the knowledge we may forget and the will that may fail us, we might open a spring of infinite action in the deep inner motion of our hearts. This silent upsurge, the pastor suggests, is the original and originating hand of God. It is an unsinking source of joy in the face of everything, life and death and all in all, that holds us above the abyss. I conclude with a brief, unscientific postscript. There is an old expression for a certain kind of widespread intellectual error. The wish is father to the thought. In teaching that what does not build you up is no truth for you, the pastor unabashedly flies in the face of this objection. And yet, readers of either or cannot avoid questioning what I have called love's knowledge, the silent argument of the soul's deepest emotions. This is because the servant stands in part two of either or precisely where the seducer's diary stands in part one. It is as if Kierkegaard wanted to tease us with the demonic possibility that God, the God of love, the God who both Moses and Jesus exhort us to love with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might, is a seducer and a deceiver. But the pastor prophecies that if we believe this, we shall forsake that beautiful law and end in chaos. In any case, we have already answered and will continue to answer the question of who God is and who we are in what Kierkegaard suggests is the only meaningful way in the lives we have.
insist on living. Thank you. Is Jesus like the man of faith in that fear and trembling, or is it something more like Socrates with infinite nature? Like, how to picture Jesus uh, in terms of his human character as we're describing? He comes into the temple and tears everything down. Is he like the man of faith? Uh, how does he embrace the fun? Are you asking me how he depicts Jesus in either or? Sure. Um, um, so that's a good question because I, he doesn't really show up except in the sermon. So, um, I mean, I can talk to you about how he depicts Jesus in other Kierkegaard texts, perhaps. Um, but I'm not sure that's your question, right? I mean, it's hard because there's probably a reason why Jesus doesn't show up in either or. The absence seems important. But yeah, tell me about something, something else. Well, okay, so um, in the book called Philosophical Fragments or Philosophical Problems in the New Translation, uh, he talks about um, God's love of human beings and God's desire to be understood by human beings. Um, and he has the following argument, uh, which will begin to answer your question perhaps. Uh, he considers two alternatives about how the truth can be learned. The first is the alternative of philosophy, which is we can learn it on our own, which means we possess the condition for understanding the truth, and we just have to exercise our natural capabilities. The other alternative is that we is that we don't possess the condition for understanding the truth, that, that it's not possible for us to do so. And the argument then is, well, God wouldn't have created us without the ability to understand the truth, so we must have lost that condition. And this becomes an argument for sin. And God's desire is for a kind of equality, spiritual, intellectual equality with us, a kind of uh, co-equal relationship. Um, and that means that God wants us to understand the truth, and therefore God has to give us the condition for understanding the truth um, and, and redeem us from sin. The problem is that that's an enormous gift. And if you receive such an enormous gift, he has a wonderful analogy. It would be like you're the lowliest maiden in the kingdom, and the king sends the carriage for you and announces that he wants to marry you. So this is between the sinful human being and God is even greater than that between the king and the maiden. And the problem is that if you take the maiden into the palace, the maiden will be so dazzled by the splendor of the king as to simply be overcome by it and, and be sort of enslaved to, you know, she would understand herself as utterly indebted and never sort of be over, able to overcome the fact that, that uh, she didn't deserve this and so forth. So he has an argument for the necessity of incarnation. Rather than bringing the learner up to him, God has to descend to the learner. And Jesus, that is the incarnation that is philosophically necessary by this argument. That's a beginning to answer your question, okay? And you can also look at Jesus another way as exemplifying what Kierkegaard, not just Pumicus, understands as the task of existence. And that is holding together the absolute, infinite, uh, eternal truth, right, with your own finite, time-bound, particular existence. And Jesus does that in an exemplary fashion. By the way, Socrates also does that in an exemplary fashion. He's closely related to Jesus in this way. So that would be another path into your question. This element of always in the wrong in relationship to God, I think it solves the problem of theodicy, so to speak, okay? But does it account for praising God and being right with respect to God? In other words, if we're always wrong when we're praising God, this is not a good situation to be in. Well, so if I understand you correctly, you're saying that um, if we're always in the wrong, we're also wrong in praising God. Is that what you're saying? That would seem to follow. That's what I was trying to In other words, if I understand it, Whenever we criticize God for the world being in so much problem, well, we ought to be like lovers and look, look further and see whether we can justify God. But if we're talking about good things in life, uh, then to be always in the wrong 
I mean, it wouldn't be possible to do the praising, the, the appreciation of the goodness of the world that you talked about, as well as appreciation, appreciating God. Now, it may be unfair to Kierkegaard to take one line of his that he repeats in one context and ask him to universalize it, but... Uh, right. Um, I suspect that um, it is being unfair to Kierkegaard. I don't think that he meant by saying we're always in the wrong relationship to God. Um, I don't think he meant that any act and like even you know we praise God for the wrong. Um, I think that in fact um, uh, giving thanks is truly appropriate in relation to God from his perspective. Um, so I think what he means by always in the wrong is when we want to uh, indict God for the conditions of the world, right? Um, and actually, there is in one of his upbuilding discourses, I actually can't remember which one, he has another version of that sermon in which he says, talks about the upbuilding thought that in relation to God, we are always guilty. Now, he doesn't say guilty in this sermon. He doesn't say that. Okay? That's pushing it even further. But I think therefore what he means in the wrong is intellectually, when we wish to bring some kind of, if we want to bring God before us as for a court or something, we're not going to win that. Um, I think that uh, this idea of living joyfully, there's a wonderful uh, upbuilding discourse called um, uh, The Bird of the Air and the Lily of the Field, I believe, in which he emphasizes the joy, the joy, the simple joy of the bird and the lily. Um, and that's really important for him. I actually would connect this. I know this is a little weird, but I'm going to throw it out because I know there's some philosophy students here as well. I would connect this with um, the end with uh, book two in Letters Republic, where in the so-called city of pigs, the people <laughs> in this first city that Socrates calls the healthy city and the true city get together in company, old and young alike, enjoy one another's company, enjoy uh, this being together, and sing hymns to God. This is prayer. The first prayer in the first healthy city is a hymn of thanksgiving. This insight, Socrates shares with Kierkegaard. You're asking, is the argument essentially like that of Job's friend who tried to explain Job's misery by saying that you must, you must have, you must have been in the wrong against God. You, God doesn't punish people who don't deserve to be punished. That can't be the case because the sermon emphasizes that the innocent were punished in Jerusalem, yeah. right? That's what's really interesting, because in this later upbuilding discourse where he says, you know, the upbuilding thought that against God we're always guilty, he actually doesn't say, he doesn't talk about God punishing innocent people, except in one case. Can you guess which one? Jesus. That's the only case in which God punishes a truly innocent person, because he's the only one. Now that's later, that's another thing that he's writing in some other book, okay? But here, he starts out with this point, and he wants to, you know... For, I think for Kierkegaard in general, not just the pastor, not just, uh, well, not just the pastor. We, it's an urgent task for human beings to, to understand the truth. And the truth about the world is that the innocent suffer. And he doesn't question that here. He extends it beyond Jesus. He doesn't talk about just this one case. And that was the part of God. So it's not that. It, it can't be that. Um, and of course, remember that God criticizes Job's friends as well, so he doesn't even think they're right, right? So in that way, maybe you could say he learns something from Job. He takes the position of God, in a way. Um, but notice what he's doing here. I think we're not really supposed to think about this as sort of objectively, well, we... The emphasis is not on you did wrong, you're bad, you screwed up, you sinned. It's on, look how great it is to love someone so much that your first thought is what you can do to make things right. How you, if you have something that you love, and you want to believe it's something considered like a parent, right, or the child. What did we do? What, what can I do? What can I do? And can I trace the problem that I located my child back to me? You know, that's good if you can do something about it, right? And that's the hope that's opened up is, yeah, you can. Maybe there's something you omitted or something that you 
that you did that you can change that will that will make it right. Um, you know who this reminds me of? It reminds me of the teaching of Father Zosima and the Brothers Karamazov, who says, each of us is guilty before all and everything, basically. Each of and he used the word guilty, but we're all responsible for the moral condition of our fellow human beings. Uh, and that's a really interesting teaching because it works in every direction. It gets very complicated. But so I think it's not what, what you can do. The relation of Kierkegaard to this past. Oh, I think, I mean, look. This, okay, so either or is his first pseudonymous work. It's followed up nine months later by Pure and Trouble. Um, and then the next year, Philosophical Fragments is published, and off or off the line. Um, we have to be careful. Okay, first I have to tell you that at the end of concluding on scientific postcode, Kierkegaard says, please do me the favor of not attributing the views of my pseudonymous authors to me. You know, I make the authors and they write the books. So, but I've been doing that. I mean, I, because I think you sort of have to get some kind of picture. And from where I stand, this sermon is a pivotal transition from the spheres of aesthetic existence, which I tried to describe in the paper, and ethical existence, to a kind of authentic religiosity. This sermon tries to break open those modes A and B, which are the, the first two letters of the human alphabet, so to speak, for, for Kierkegaard, of the types of human existence um, in the modern world. Um, and so I think it, it's this transitional thing. And then when we get to period trembling and when we get to philosophical fragments, um, we get uh, this focus on the question of faith, and in particular as revealed through really hard episodes, like Abraham taking Isaac up the mountain, or, you know, the, the pseudonymous authors love um, hard sayings of Jesus, okay? Like, for example, in Luke, Jesus says somewhere, if you don't hate your brother and your sister and so forth, you can't love me. And Kierkegaard writes, you know, he says hate, he doesn't say like less or something like that. The first time I ever taught this, I grabbed the Bible to bring it in. And it was a Catholic Bible, and they had a footnote. I opened it up to that passage in Luke, and it says, If you don't hate your brother and sister, and the verb is misein, Greek, hate. And sure enough, the footnote says, By hate, Jesus means love less. <laughs> right. that, listen, we need a kinder, gentler Jesus. No, no, no. He wants the Jesus who's going to hit you over the head with the axe and break you open. But he turns to questions of faith, and that's where he's headed. Uh, so I think the sermon is like really crucial, it's pivotal. The question was, do I think that when he began to write these synonymous works, Kierkegaard had in view this project of starting at a lower level and showing the inadequacies of these lower forms, the aesthetic and the ethical, and then finally arriving, oh, you, and you pointed out that neither A nor B is Socratic. I think this is right, by the way, because Socrates has kind of erotic openness. And A and B, I'm trying to point out, are closed. And, okay, and they're not open to any part of reality, but they're sort of centered on each other in some kind of, you know, as if like Cain, if I can kill the other guy, I can somehow. Anyway, um, so do I think he had to do this project from the start of his authorship, and then finally to go to Socrates and then have a collision between, between philosophy and faith, or, or put those together? Uh, you know, it's interesting, in an unpublished book, although one that he instructed his brother, if I'm not mistaken, whoever he instructed, to publish after his death, called The Point of View for My Work as an Author, he claims that he had this project from the beginning, okay? Um, you mean this very one? This very project, right. Well, well, the project of moving from the aesthetic and the ethical to the religious. Uh, in that book, by the way, he says, it is true, I know, that Socrates was not a Christian, but that I believe that he has become one. <laughs> he has become one. That is to say, he's a Christian Socrates, here a Christian Socrates, okay. Um, so, in the point of view, he claims that he had this project. I don't know whether he did. I strongly suspect that he had at least the kernel of this project. I think that either or suggests that in its general outlines, I guess I would say, yes, 
he had this project? Was it as worked out? Could it have been as worked out when he finished writing either or in 1843 as it was? You know. And again, I tried to say in the very beginning of my talk, I suggested the sermon forms a bridge not only to the later pseudonymous words, the pseudonymous words that would follow that are focused on faith, but to the upbuilding discourses. And to repeat, the upbuilding discourse was published by a certain S. Kierkegaard. Why do I say that? I mean, you, you might say, well, you mean published by Kierkegaard. Well, S. Kierkegaard could be a pseudonym. Okay, you see what I'm saying? In other words, it's not. <laughs> anyway, it's very complicated stuff when you get right down to it in this literary structure. But nonetheless, that sermon opens up. It is, in fact, numbered by Kierkegaard scholars as the first upbuilding discourse. That one I'm talking about right here. He doesn't call it. But it is called on the unbuilding thought that we're always in the wrong. Okay, so fine. It itself is a bridge to the publications of S. Kierkegaard, who, if he is a pseudonym, is closer to Kierkegaard perhaps than the other pseudonyms. And the pseudonymous works. Either or is a very well constructed book. I think he definitely had in view breaking open these deficient existential circles, as I put it. Now, with regard to Socrates, look, he wrote his dissertation on Socrates. His dissertation, a magnificent work, as you know, called The Concept of Irony, Continual Reference to Socrates. And in that dissertation, all the themes I've talked about here, I'm actually going to talk about this tomorrow at a conference, that this dissertation, about the anxiety of loving a character whose reality you're not really sure about, and, you know, are in relation to Socrates in the dissertation. Um, but already he has, I mean, the, as soon as we get to Philosophical Fragments in 1844, we have a much more positive picture of Socrates that's already hinted at in the dissertation, but more positive in general than this purely ironic character of the dissertation, who basically takes individuals, as he puts it, takes them out in the middle of the ocean and drops them. He's a very negative character. Yeah, he's a negative character. He is, in fact, infinite absolute negativity, as he describes him. Okay? Although he takes it back in the dissertation in some ways. But in any case, he already has Socrates in view. He already hints at the possibility of an erotic Socrates, which is then fully developed in philosophical fragments and in postscript. And the erotic Socrates is this guy who is aware of his own ignorance, who quests to come into relationship to some larger reality, who doesn't run away from it, who's not offended by the possibility of the incomprehensibility of this reality. Um, who's not systematic, whose task is a task of existence that is taking the truth into his own life. These are all features uh, of the Christian position as well. So I think he already saw these things coming together. So that's a long answer to your question. The question was, is there not a relationship, and I appreciate your suggestion because I hadn't thought about it this way, between the idea that we're always in the wrong, right? The upbuilding thought that we're always in the wrong against God, on the one hand, and how he describes philosophy in philosophical fragments as untrue. Actually, I should say more broadly, in philosophical fragments we have two hypotheses. One is philosophy, one is faith. And I mentioned philosophy is the idea that we have the conditions, the condition for understanding the truth. We can get there on our own steam. And faith is we don't even have the condition that God's going to give it to us. From the perspective of philosophy, religion is untrue. Faith is untrue. And from the perspective of faith, philosophy is untrue. So that needs to be said at the outset. But is there a connection between the untruth of those positions, right, and being always in the wrong against God? I think I might need more time to think about it. <laughs> Having stated your question, I'm not sure I can do justice to it with an off the cuff answer. I would say, again, let me emphasize, the, the angle of the sermon is to build us up for the tasks of life. And that means to achieve a practical effect. It is a rhetorical act that attempts to achieve a practical effect. What is the effect he's attempting to achieve? Well, let's go to fear and trembling, okay? What's so exciting about faith, what's so fantastic about faith, as presented in fear and trembling, is essentially that it is a preservation of youth. That is to say, almost the first line of fear and trembling, right after the preface is, uh, life fragments of uh, what is held together in the pious simplicity of the child. Okay? Life breaks apart a childlike enthusiasm and, and joy. This is a very old theme. It goes all the way back to, you know, Ecclesiastes. Uh, it goes all 
little bit back here. Stop means if I can show this way more time, it's Faust. It's this question of how do we retain, as adults, mature adults, the enthusiasm for life of a child? I mean, this is a wonderful question, but the figure of Abraham in fear and trembling is the model for you. How does this land deal with this? Abraham and Sarah, like 100 years old. And still, you know, they're having babies and stuff. I mean, they're young. That's the whole thing. And and they have everything, every, they accept everything with joy, if you like. I and mean, this is one way to look at it. And by the way, also terror, but that's those things are not unrelated from here to in some strange way. So what he wants to do is instill us with that spirit so that when life, you know, hammers us, we're somehow still joyful. We're ready. And and hopeful. Um, that's the point of the sermon. Now, uh, what I want to say about the positions of untruth and velocity and faith is that's somewhat different because the, the whole context there is learning the truth. It's this intellectual context. Not only, of course, because it has to do with existence, but that's the way it's framed. Let me stop there because I really don't want to... If I give you an answer, it's not going to be a very good one. Okay. So the question was, is, is Kierkegaard thinking Jewishly because there are so many hundreds of commandments, it's impossible to actually do them all, to, to be righteous fully, to adhere to all these commandments. You know, you could also ask me whether he was thinking like Paul, who says that the law is there just to reveal the impossibility of fulfilling the law. You know this argument with Paul, he says, this is what the law is for, right? The law shows us we're sinners. The law kills, <laughs> in the sense that nobody can fulfill the law. And what the law is there to do is to bring home the consciousness of sin. Now, I, what I want to do is actually take issue with your claim that this is a Jewish law. I have to make this. Okay. <laughs> because, because, the, because I want to say that, I mean, the whole Jewish perspective is, is, is really complex as well, right? As you know, God says at one point to the Israelites, this law is not in heaven. Meaning, I think it's not all the way over here. You, you guys can do this stuff. This isn't too difficult, dudes. You know, try it. On the other hand, there is, in the liturgical calendar every year, a day of atonement. And not only that, the day of atonement begins with the ceremony of Holy Dre, which is where the Jewish people promise or say, any vows that we take right now on this Yom Kippur, you know, to be good and righteous and so forth, please don't hold us to it. Because we're going to break those vows this year. That's interesting. So there, actually there, now I've just given you your argument for why this might be a Jewish point, but this is the Colby Drake thing, right? In other words, that's, this is kind of an acknowledgement that actually maybe the law is not in heaven, but it's not down here on earth either. It's, it's pretty, it's, it, it's hard. Um, so could he be thinking in this way? Uh, yeah, I think so, in the general sense that, look, he wants to bring home to us our fragility and our finitude. And especially our fragility and finitude, well, in both theory and practice, right? Yeah. Who can really say to himself, you do what you can? I love that part of the sermon. That's baloney. And you all know it. You all know it. We all know it. I know it. You know, so that probably still say, well, I did what I could. Really? I, I, I really wondered, like, let's just take a, an easy contact. Running a race. How about a long distance race? Did you run as fast as you could? Did you really? Because unless you face planted in utter exhaustion as you hit the finish line, Unless your body completely disintegrated, you didn't run as hard as you could. And I can use that example in many spheres of life. So, I mean, I'm sorry to lecture you about being other young. Don't tell me you did as much as you could. Okay? So practically, we really can't make that point. And, and, okay, and theoretically we can't, because the theoretical claim is, I got the framework, I have the criteria, and I can make the judgment. Well, that's very dangerous. And it's unsurprising. <laughs> in some basic way. To 
to really stand on that, especially in relationship to the creator of all creation. So the question is, the sermon I described as having two strands, speaking to two different audiences, are they meant to be completely compatible? Right. This is a really good question, and it certainly occurred to me while I was writing this talk. Um, and I tried to sort of finesse it, because I said, look, you know, Jesus talks like Isaiah, you know, we, you know and Jesus teaches that you should love righteousness and so forth. Um, and the Jewish scripture tells you you should love God. Uh, and actually, I'm glad you asked that. I'm not going to answer the question immediately, because, but, but I want to say, I'm glad you asked me that question, because it relates to the earlier question. I want to say, in general, he thinks Jewishly a heck of a lot. I mean, it's really interesting, right? He writes a book called Fear and Trembling. And this guy's a Christian. And he wants to awaken Christians to reality, and make them come to grips with reality, and then develop a kind of faith that can emerge in that contact with reality. And then really struggle with their faith and, and internalize it and understand what it means. And he does that by writing on something in the Hebrew Bible. Now, by the way, I don't think it's just, you know, I think he looks back at Abraham and he says, this guy, this is terrific because all of the three Western faiths come out of this, right? This, this is, this is, you, you, and in general, he likes to go back to the sources. So if you want to know what philosophy is, go back to Socrates. If you claim that you don't be on Socrates and philosophy, sorry, that's false. You want to know what, what religion is, you've got to go back, right? So he's at the forefront of this, you know, get back to the sources kind of idea in philosophy. Um, but to go back to your question, are these two strands compatible? It's a really interesting question, and I'll tell you, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say that they are. I'm gonna throw out one reason why they might not be. The second part of the sermon suggests that, use the following analogy, if you love a human being infinitely, you'll want to be in the wrong in relation to them. Well, that's how it is in relation to God. Now, we have to ask, ask the question, where does this infinite love of God come from? Like, where does this love of God that's as great as the love you might have for a human person come from? Well, the Christian scriptures have an answer to that. The loving incarnation of God. The act of incarnation. Which, by the way, in philosophical fragments, he says, this is really all you need to know. Is that God uh, became incarnate, lived and died. Um, because what that tells you is God loves you. Infinitely. And that's like the essential information that you need. That loving God is the God Luther wants us to focus on. Not that God who works all in all in life and death and so forth, and who is best left alone according to the word. But that God, for sure, is at least one face of Yahweh, or of the creator of all creation, right? This is the awesome, mighty creator. So what I want to suggest is that if the incarnation as an act of love makes possible certainly for Christians, the reciprocated love of God. Is the same thing possible in relation to Yahweh? There's a wonderful book by the literary critic Harold Bloom, okay, called Yahweh and Jesus, the Names Divine. And he has a lot of juicy statements about Yahweh. He says things like, I don't like him. <laughs> you know, I don't trust him. And that's perfectly fine, because when you read these scriptures, yeah. I mean, I'll tell you what Jesus won't do. Jesus won't tell you to take your son up a mountain and cut his throat and drink his blood and burn. Yahweh did. So, can you love Yahweh? <laughs> In other words, if you, if you translate it into Jewish context, you say, so, you know, you love Yahweh, right? <laughs> Infinitely. Well, you're commanded to. But I'm not sure that's the response from the Jewish perspective. Which is why the emphasis is on you will do early and late will be And you'll hold on like Jacob. I think it's a more spirited position. Are they compatible? I think they're compatible in the outcome. That is to say, I think he's saying you can get there from two paths. You can get there from the Jewish path, you can get there from the Christian path. Um, are they compatible in a deeper sense than that? Uh, I don't know if that's kind of perfect. 
Yeah. The book that, that you put here from Luke 19. Yes. So here Jesus is speaking more like a shepherd. Yeah. He's been, yeah. So it's very troubling. And so this picture of, of him being uh, this all loving right. person is not consistent yeah. throughout the uh, text. That's a great point. It's, it's a great point because it's an obvious point. Nevertheless, it escaped my attention. Uh, and I think it's a very, I mean, this is really interesting, right? Because just having said, if you think about the argument, right? Yeah, you love God, like you love him. You, you want to be the wrong. But the Jesus he gives us is, you know, he is a, he's a tough one. You know, he's busting up tables and stuff like this, you know, grabbing people by the ear or something. I mean, I'm just making it up, right? But, you know, he's a tough guy. That's, that's Kierkegaard all over. He loves these kinds of paradoxes, right? I mean, because, look, the truth is, from the Christian perspective, I think, I think he thinks the truth is this from the Christian perspective. Who's God? Yahweh and Jesus. That is to say, he's calling attention. Look, this is really weird. Jesus is weeping. Jesus is weeping. He's weeping. Why? Because God is going to destroy Jerusalem. Quay man, and maybe quay God too, he's weeping. Although that's very strange. I mean, here he's full of compassion, and yet this wrathful God is going to destroy his city. And yet he is God, right? That's reality. That's, 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 now you say to me, wait a second, this is an intellectual contradiction. Well, now, once again, we come to the limits of intellect. Um, and we need some kind of different response. But, you know, maybe the best we can do is look deep inside ourselves for the inner motion of the heart and see what's there. I know that sounds mysterious, but it, it, it is mysterious. Anyway, I, I thank you for that point. I think it's really interesting. We don't see, you know, the nice, gentle Jesus that we're supposed to love in this text. The only Jesus we see is the guy who picks him up in the head. Yeah. So the question is, I had talked about the, the Jesus being a paradigm, an example of bringing the finite and the infinite together. It could be the case that the idea that we're always in the wrong in relation to God points to the impossibility of our bringing those two incompatible things, if you like, together adequately. I think, the, I, I think that's a really good insight as well. Um, Could you repeat the insight? So the insight is, <laughs> is that in our existence, we, like Jesus, an exemplar for us, have to bring together the finite and the infinite, the eternal and the temporal, right? We have to, you can put it graphically, we have to take the eternal truth, universal truth, into our particular finite temporal existence. So I can know the idea of justice, but I've got to enact that in my current circumstances, right? Now there's always an opening here for mistakes, right? But this is the good point. In fact, look, this is why, this is why, this is, this is actually a source of sin, almost a fundamental source of sin, if you see what I mean. Because, I mean, let me illustrate it. Okay, so this summer I was in France, and we went to Normandy, and that was really great. And I read, all these, I read a couple of books on the whole D-Day invasion and so forth, and one of the things I discovered is that the top generals on both the Axis and the Allied side were in fundamental disagreement about strategy. So here we have these guys. They've got their theory. They also have experience. And they know the situation, and they don't know. And they have these debates about what the right thing to do is. Now, if you are a military commander, like I know, you make a decision. And then you pray, <laughs> basically, if you're a religious person, right? And what you know is that you will be put to the test, events will emerge, and your decision will be shown to be a good one or a bad one. But you're doing the best you can to apply that knowledge in this particular context. And failure is always possible. Incidentally, um, this is not a great analogy in some ways because you can always measure the military decisions by did you lose, did you win? Whereas in existence, it's not always that clear. That produces anxiety, right? How do we even know what I did was right? Um, so the whole question of what are the criteria as well as am I going to meet those criteria, these are sources of anxiety and certainly guilt and certainly, if you want to look at it religiously, 
sin or at least error if you don't want to look at it religiously. So I think that I think that in that sense, you know, it doesn't mean this thing. Someone could say, well, it doesn't mean you're always in the wrong, but it means you're always possibly in the wrong. Right? It's all it's it's an ever present danger. So the question is, could this wrongness be something ontological about a lack of self-understanding? Yes. <laughs> I, I guess. I mean, <laughs> yes. I mean, um, you know, there is a whole question of what it means to be a self, what it means to exist as a self. And this comes up in theory art as it does in many philosophers. And um, the self is as mysterious perhaps as God, you know, in some way. Uh, but I'll, let me leave it at that. I don't want to say more about that because I fear that it might not be very interesting or true. Yeah. Is he mocking the pastor because the pastor's sermon was also the end of either or as a whole? Answer this line, for the only the truth that builds up is, the, is truth for you. Right. Um, why do you think that would be mocking the pastor? Can you explain why that is mocking? What, what, what's behind your thought here? Well, we...
energetically, enthusiastically do what is required, right? Um, it's a very interesting perspective. Yeah. Is that the way for you? This, right. Only the truth that builds up is the truth for you. So, in, look, in the background here, let me, let me give another example. Um, the truth of Hegel's system, from Kierkegaard's perspective, might be objectively true, but it has no relevance to an existing human being. So it's not for you. It's not something you can live by. These are the truths that he's looking for, the truths you can live by. And then the question is, what helps you to actually live by those truths? That is, to go about your business of living enthusiastically and energetically. Okay, so this is a great question. Are we going back to Genesis? You point out the themes here of chaos. If the beautiful law doesn't, doesn't uh, continue in existence, will collapse into chaos. And then you said, why don't we accept the fact that I mean, we learn from Genesis, Genesis 3, there's the connotation between God, you know, that Adam and Eve eat the fruit, and that God finds out, and we get kicked out of Eden. Um, shouldn't we learn from there that we're not, we're not gods, we're not going to be gods? Uh, and therefore, in the fundamental sense, we're always in the wrong. I like what you say about that. Well, well, okay, so we're seeking the truth, but I thought we were saying that, I mean, since we're always seeking the truth, we're never in possession of the truth, right? Right, and in that sense, in that sense, there's, this, there's a sense in which we are always in the wrong. In the same way, let me, let me, let me maybe I'm taking, I might take a question, but let me say this. You know, Socrates says, I don't know, you know, I, I'm ignorant, right? And on one level, that's false, because Socrates is certainly, relatively speaking, not ignorant at all, compared to other Athenians. But on the absolute level, it's true, because he doesn't actually possess wisdom. Right? Okay, but let me go back to the Genesis point. You said that this reminds you of Genesis, and I think it does. And I think what's really interesting here, there, this, this passage reminds me of, um, there are rabbinic midrashim, midrashim, about God's offer that the Israelites couldn't refuse at Sinai. And the Midrash teaches God, there are a couple of versions of it, right? Um, but the most interesting version is, you know, if you don't accept the laws I'm giving to you today, the laws of nature will cease to exist, the universe will collapse. Interesting, right? Now, I think that it, it, that's in the spirit of this, right? In other words, Look, if you human beings don't keep that beautiful law in existence, human life will collapse into chaos. And that will be just as dreadful as if the laws of nature collapse. Um, what that means is in a weird way, we, we might not be God, but we are absolutely essential in the maintenance of God's order and creation. That's very important. And that's what I was trying to say. I'm not trying to say, I wasn't trying to imply that God cannot assist us and so forth. All I'm saying is that if we don't care for these laws and respect justice and righteousness, our will will end. I think that's pretty clear. Unfortunately, it's clear every day, you know, when you read the newspapers. Um, so we're really, really crucial to this project. And I think, I think, I think you're right. I think your insight is really correct here that we, that we are sort of going back to the beginning. But in a weird way, the beginning that he's directing us for is this deep inner motion of the heart. In other words, what is the ultimate route to God here? Not going out intellectually learning because we bash into this inscrutable reality, but going in and finding in the deep inner motion of the heart the traces of that. God. That's the ecstatic charge. The ecstatic charge. I like that. Yeah, I did you make that up or where did you I thought I did, but I don't want to explain it. It's just because I don't even know the sunshine. Ecstatic charge. Yeah, well, I thought I'd be wrong for that. It was at MIT when we had talked about students in the house classes, and I could talk about it. I like that. I like that. And I thought it's ecstatic. I think when you have a sense of the truth, and not the whole truth, but just the truth in your sort of quest. Yes. There is a kind of joy. Yes, it's, yes. It's not a charge. And, so there's a, and love is, I think, um, how we express it. And let me say this also. Um, in this little upbuilding discourse called The Bird of the Air and the Lily of the Field,
Kyrgios. Kierkegaard says, and he's writing his own name, or at least S. Kierkegaard, learn from the bird and the lily. Now here's what he says. He says, the bird and the lily can't speak. He says, but don't we pride ourselves on speech? And he doesn't refer to Aristotle, but you know, Aristotle says, you know, the blog on speech is, reason speech is the most distinctive feature. This is what makes us human and so forth. This is what distinguishes us from the animals. Kierkegaard is reversing that. He says, learn from the learn to build like the bird and the lily. Be silent. Close your ears. Stop the chatter. He talks about chatter in a lot of his books. In other words, like for example, at one point in Philosophical Fragments, he says, there was only one advantage, there's one huge advantage that the first followers of the incarnate God of Jesus had over us today. They didn't have 2,000 years of chatter to mess up their understanding. Okay? So this is really, in other words, it's in us. This is the gift of the eternity. It's in us. Silence yourself. Be still and know. Yes, right. And listen. Listen. I, I say this to someone who's talked to myself or is, is only listen. <laughs> it's kind of absurd. 